in the previous slide, we used the uh, reinforcement learning. And basically it was policy gradient. We are gonna talk about that later. Can you change the optimizer for the architectures to a different type of an optimizer? The first thing to note is that it has to be gradient free. You cannot use gradients. And that's why maybe random search is a good idea. Maybe reinforcement learning is a good idea. You cannot put a grid on that because the grid is gonna be running into the curse of dimensionality. So it's either random search, reinforcement learning, or you can use evolutionary algorithms. And we're gonna see a typical example of evolutionary algorithm here for architecture set. We're gonna stick to the search space that we defined in the previous slide. So it's gonna be exactly the same search space where you have normal cell and reduction cells. And we're gonna look for the cell structure, which is again, the same as before. So nothing is gonna change. Now the question is how we're gonna optimize these. Actually the, the entire cell, but we're gonna do it one at a time. And the choices that we have to make are these connections, where are they coming from, these operations, and whether you're gonna concatenate or add. And these numbers zero and one are the input. This is the second choice that the network made. This is the third, this is the fourth, fifth, sixth, and then concatenation is the end one. This may be jumping ahead, but are these made being made uh, like sequentially or are they uh, these decisions being made sort of in tandem? They are being made sequentially. So okay. you first choose the second one because the third one has an option for this arrow to be coming from the outcome of the second operation. Mm, okay, that makes sense. Of the second block. So it has to be sequential. So what is evolution? In very simple terms, that's just random search plus selection. You do a random search and then you select the ones that are the best, you keep them. And then the ones that did the worst, you're gonna either keep them or discard them. But the idea is that the ones that are doing the best are gonna be selected. And that's how evolution is gonna work. It's random search plus selection. We're gonna use regularized evolution and the algorithm is very simple. So I don't want you guys to panic. It's not that hard. You start with an empty population at time zero and we are gonna create a history. These two are just, this is a list, that's a queue when you want to write the code for it. So there's a population, there is a history. Initially, we are gonna randomly uh, select some architectures and put it inside our population. And our population size is gonna be capital P. So we're gonna have a population size and, it, and it's gonna have P members. We are gonna select a random architecture. So we're gonna select one of these random totally at random, that's gonna be your model architecture. We're gonna train and evaluate the architecture that was randomly selected. So that's gonna be our initial population. We add the model to the right of the population. So you have a list, at the end of the list, you're adding uh, your model and the model is now trained. So you know how good that model is and you know its architecture which is randomly selected, but you know what that architecture is. And we keep, and we add that model to the history. Now we are gonna keep evolving for C cycles or C generation. First, we are gonna sample S candidates from the population, from the initial population. So we are gonna keep sampling S items or S models from our initial population. And these are just random elements. That's gonna give you a candidate. And then you keep adding that candidate to the sample. Now, after this operation, you're gonna have a bunch of samples. Basically, you sample your population. So far, everything was random. It was random search. Here is where the selection is gonna come in. The one that is doing the best in terms of its accuracy from the sample, that's gonna be your parent. So that one we're gonna choose. The best one from this sample, we're gonna keep that. That's a selection. And the parent that we chose, we're gonna change it slightly. We're gonna mutate it. And I'm gonna tell you what uh, mutation is exactly when it comes to this problem. So we're gonna change the parent architecture slightly to give us the child architecture. Now we train and evaluate the child architecture. You add the child to the population. We add it to our population set. You add the child to the history. And here is where aging comes in. The one model in your population that's the oldest. It means to the left of your queue, we're gonna drop that. Maybe it was a good model. Maybe it was a bad model. Maybe we never tested it. We never chose it as part of our samples, but we are gonna get rid of that. And that's gonna 
act as a regular as a regularization for your evolution. And once the entire uh, history for C cycles or C generations is passed, you're gonna return the best model in your history. That's why you are keeping the history. So the best model out of this evolutionary algorithm is gonna be the one that we're gonna choose. So I, I owe you one thing, I owe you what is mutation. The rest of it was just random uh, search and uh, training and evaluation. The only part that you don't know what that is, it's mutation. You can either mutate these arrows, for instance, the arrow to this operation six, you can change it to come from four or from the outcome of five or two or one or zero. That's called hidden state mutation. Rather than coming from the third one, it could come from the fourth one. And this is also random. There is another mutation. You just randomly select another operation. Maybe do nothing, maybe identity, maybe convolution. And these are the mutations. And this is how our evolutionary algorithm is faring against reinforcement learning and random search. So it's gonna take you less time to come up with a good model, but then it turns out that the reinforcement learning is given enough time is doing as good as evolution. And here is how your model, the, in the end, you're gonna get an end of with two models. N, we know what that is. N was the number of, N is here, the number of normal cells. And F is your feature size. And you're gonna end up with very good models in terms of accuracy. Now you want to see what is the effect of this regularization? How is it helping? How is aging helping us? Without aging, if you just drop the worst candidate from your sample, you're gonna end up with one of these models that are below this line. This is the non-aging test accuracy. This is the aging test accuracy. Each cross here, you have two options to make, either regularize or don't regularize. The ones that you're regularizing are lying above this line. It means that they are doing, most of them are doing uh, really good, much better than not regularizing. So the aging is actually helping us. And in the end, this is a typical type of a model that you're gonna end up with after this architecture search. Okay, I'm one minute over time. For those of you who have questions, you're more than welcome to stay and ask. And for those of you who want to leave, you can leave. I have a, a sort of meta question that's a little uh, subjective, but do you think that the the best path forward is to you know use the tool, because all of these, you know, finding the best model is using tools that are currently available. Um, and so sort of the flip side is trying to improve the tools we have. So like the residual connections or batch normalization, like new novel ideas that uh, improved things. So do you, what, what do you think is the better path forward is to, you know, search in these giant sort of parameter spaces for a, a perfect model or try to innovate in a, in a different way? I think both of them are viable options. That depends on the amount of resources that you have at your hand. Most of these papers about AutoML are being written by employees of these giant companies. For instance, the previous paper is from Google and they have compared to us infinite amount of resources. And why is that important? Because this type of a research takes a lot of time to, for you to end up with, a, with the best architecture because you have to train first and evaluate on your validation. The other one that you mentioned is coming up with smart uh, alternatives to convolutions. That one is also a great contribution. So one is brute force, the other one is being smart. And that's a choice that you can make. Uh, oh, I, just saw, I saw a quote that was, uh, I can't remember who, but someone said like, we, we can't get to the moon by building a taller ladder, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. So at some point these are just trying to build a ladder really tall, but at some point there needs to be like a, I don't know, better way of doing things. Cool. I'm sure. And Jeffrey Hinton says the next revolution in AI is gonna come from a student from some university who is gonna start doubting everything. So along the same lines, mm -hmm. um, doesn't it seem like we've just gone from feature engineering to architecture design to architecture design design? Like, isn't this all about the parameterization of the search space? Exactly. And the other one is the choice of the search algorithm. You can have multiple different sort algorithms, reinforcement yeah. learning, random search, Bayesian optimization, etc. But you, yes, you're definitely right. Are there any results about sort of how, how much coverage you're getting out of any of these particular um, 
parameterization. It's like the NASNet parameterization mm-hmm. it covers some, some subset of neural networks, but how many does it cover neural networks? Does it mostly cover neural networks that we've, you know, designed by hand? Like, you know, maybe, maybe ResNet fit, fits into this architecture structure or, or et cetera. Like, or, or is this really just, or is this a, like a much larger broadening of our typical search space? I think the search space is huge if you think about it. And it's beyond any human to be able to solve that problem, to come up with the best architecture. Totally, totally. But it seems like maybe it's just a generalization of ideas we already had and not, like, is there enough flexibility in the, in the search space to come up with a truly new idea? Not really, because that's what you're starting with. You are telling yeah. the network that you have an option between separable convolutions and convolutions and max pooling. So these are the ideas that are already available at this small scale. But then how do you combine them is the question that these papers are trying to answer. How do you mix and match? Which is really valuable because in the end, once you end up with an architecture that's working, you're done. You can take that into production and uh, make profit. Honey, thank you. I appreciate it. So there is a question from Justice. How much of improvement do you think can be attributed to greater model capacity? Looking at uh, that architecture, it has 469 million parameters, which is far greater than other architectures. That's a really valid point. So usually the way things work is that you try to stay within the same parameter or number of parameters or multiplication at at least this this architecture is of the same order as PMASnet 5, NASnet, etc. It's of the same order. But the other one, you're right. It's huge. Does that answer your question? I think it's true. So they likely include that just to demonstrate the ability of unrestricted. Exactly. So what happens if you don't restrict the amount of computation and model capacity? You're right. Any other questions? Okay, then if there are no more questions, see you next time.